We do want to welcome anybody who is at home watching online or anybody from our Mount Dora campus who happened to stay home today. Uh, listen, if you stayed home from Mount Dora, you're missing a free made-to-order omelet bar that we're rocking out there because that's how we roll in Mount Dora. I just want you to know, okay? <laughs> Now, a couple of things uh, that I, I came upon this week, you know, we take a lot of things for granted in this world, a lot of things for granted in our lives. You know, when we come home, most of the time you turn on the light switch, you expect the lights to come on. Sometimes that's been happening. Sometimes that's been not happening in our house recently. You know, you come home or you get in the car and you turn the key and you expect the car to turn on, right? I mean, you take that for granted uh, each and every day you get up and go to work, but there's something else that we uh, take for granted, at least I took for granted uh, this week. You see, uh, I went to get my hair cut on Thursday. Now, here's the issue. Uh, every time I come to preach, I want to go and get a fresh cut so I look as good as humanly possible, which is a task, let me tell you. Uh, at least be presentable is what I'm going for. So, so I go into the barber shop because we don't go to those, uh, you know, the, the, the named places. We go to a barber shop. And I walk in and a guy waves me back right away. I'm like, okay, I've never seen this guy before. And I go back in and I sit down and I say, okay, I want a one on the side, a four on the tops and take the one up pretty high and then fade it on in so there's no line, square up the back, you know how it is. <laughs> so a dude next to me, the other chair, he interprets it to my barber in Spanish. And I'm like, uh-oh. Uh-oh. So I'm like, Dios mio, let's go, all right? That's about all I got in Spanish. So, I mean, he, he's, he's, you know, buzzing away on my head, and then all of a sudden it takes a weird turn because then it comes out with a, a flat razor, a straight razor, and he starts shaving up the beard a little bit. And I'm like, oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. We don't usually do the beard now. We just do the head of hair. So he starts straight razor in that, and I'm like, oh, boy. Uh, because you can't, like, pull away. I mean, the dude's got a razor right in your face. <laughs> And once you start on that, you don't stop in the middle. You just have him finish and pray for the best. And so he does that, and he does down below, and then he does kind of up here. And I'm like, man, this is different. And then it got a little weird for me, okay? Because then he went to the ears. And then he started shaving the ear hairs that were apparently completely out of control. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is weird, okay? I took this for granted in my life that I'd be able to communicate with the guy that's chopping up my head. Then it went even weirder because he went into the nose, right? And then you're like, whoa, but you don't jump back. I'm telling you, he's got it. So he goes into the nose, but he hits that one part in your nose. And all of a sudden, I'm a middle-aged man sitting there in the barbershop crying because he hits something and I'm tearing up and it's coming down. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. And then the final straw was he went for the eyebrows. And I'm like, uh, uh, I mean, you don't jump back. And he got the one and I heard some clips go off. So I'm like, oh boy, oh boy, please, dear Lord, please, dear Lord, make this okay. And I, what I would say is at the end of the day, I thought he did a pretty good job. It was one of the best haircuts of my life. But I took for granted that that was not going to go very well. And uh, sometimes you do that. Now, what happens is I think this week, a lot of times we take for granted I think we get so enthralled with what's going to happen next weekend that we miss this weekend. And let me tell you, God's got a lot to do for us today and leading up to next weekend, okay? We don't want to forget that. We don't want to neglect that. We don't want to take that for granted because there's some incredible things happening in the life of Jesus today, okay? Now, let me see if I can paint this picture for you. See, there was this man that came along. His name was Jesus. And let me tell you, everyone was talking about Jesus. This was a guy who taught like nobody before him. He walked like nobody before him. He spoke like nobody before him. He lived like no one before him or after him. This guy was different. Not only did he live a life that was so contrary to this world, but all of a sudden there was this awe-inspiring power that started coming out of him that he just kind of seemed to wield left and right. That's right. It seems like at every turn in the road, miracles started happening. The crazy started happening around him. And not only was he teaching these things backwards and forwards, the scriptures he knew like the back of his hand, but now blind people can now see the one that had healed them moments before. The deaf people could now hear the sermons of the one preaching like they've never heard before. People who were crippled were now running with unhindered excitement to share the news of this man, Jesus, and what he had done for them. 
He was leading a dozen, he was healing hundreds, he was feeding thousands, and he was teaching the world the good news. Jesus was here. He was was continuing to preach that God had come to this place. Taking time away from the masses, though, every time in his life we'll see throughout scriptures that he would walk away and he would spend alone time with his disciples and with his holy father God in prayer. The God of the universe sent his son and his son wanted to communicate with him on a regular basis. And as miracle after miracle occurred and sermon after sermon was preached, the rumblings began to get louder. You see, they started whispering, this is the Messiah. This is the man that we have been waiting for for hundreds of years as a people. Finally, the king has come to rescue us. Finally, he's come to free us from this Roman rule that we are suppressed by. This will be our king, Jesus. And so on this Sunday, We celebrate the triumphant entry up into the city of Jerusalem by the King Jesus. And as he rode on the donkey, the crowds came up to him and they were laying palm branches on the ground and giant tree leaves on the ground and some were laying their cloaks and some were laying their coats because that's what you do when the king comes to town. You lay it all down for your king. And they were singing songs left and right. And scripture said, they said words like this, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Here's a quick little Greek lesson for you. Do you know what the word for Hosanna is in the original text of the New Testament? It's Hosanna. Isn't that sweet? Now, let me take it one step deeper for you. I know we're going deep today. Let's go back into the Old Testament. The Old Testament written in Hebrew. Do you know what the Hebrew word is for Hosanna? It's Hoshiana or Hosanna, the same word. But the uniqueness of that word is very interesting. I loved finding this out this week when I was reading a bunch of smart guys, okay? They said this, the word in the Old Testament is more of a cry, it's more of a holler to God. Lord God, please save us, save our lives. And then in the New Testament, it comes along in the Greek translation and it says this, God, you have saved us. You see, when Jesus comes along, words tend to mean different things now. And the words that they were shouting to him because they recognized that he was the king that they were waiting for. He is coming to save us. And I would imagine that each and every one of us sitting here or listening at home or wherever you find yourself worshiping God today, we're probably sitting on one side or the other of this Hosanna question. Are we crying out for God to save us? Or are we thanking God and praising him for coming and saving us? And maybe it's dependent on the different circumstances than you're in, maybe depending on the day and how you wake up. You see, this is the moment leading up to the cross. The king has come and crowds are going crazy. I don't know if they were doing the wave as a crowd. I don't know if they were holding up those John 3, 16 signs. I mean, that would be kind of weird and all. Maybe they had those communion helmets on with the straws that came from the top down and they were just cheering on as much as they possibly can. I mean, this was a 16 seed beating a one seed. You know what I'm talking about, people? This was insane in their day. Their king had come, but in a little less than a week's time, a bag of money and a kiss on the cheek brought him from his cheers to their jeers. Their signs changed and turned into a mocking king of the Jews that hung above his head on the cross. And their helmets became crowns of thorns that were plunged into his skull and produced the blood that answered the Hosanna question for them and their salvation. And so what happened? Well, Jesus taught and the Pharisees schemed. Jesus served and the teachers of the law started questioning. Jesus loved and there's leaders Their leaders started manipulating everything and Jesus prayed and the cross of Christ came into view. And what I want all of us to land on today is this, is that right in the midst of what was happening around Jesus as he's preparing for the cross, he prays for something that gets lost. He prays for something that we take for granted many times. Now remember, he's sitting with his disciples. He had washed their feet. Pastor Harvey talked about that a little bit last week. They'd had a meal together and they're sitting there and Jesus speaks out. He goes into this prayer that we have recorded for us in John chapter 17. If you have your scriptures and want to turn there, it'll be on the screens, it'll be on the TV. We can follow along. John chapter 17, this is the prayer of the Son of God, our King Jesus, before he heads to the cross. He says this, he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. 
For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that you, they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I've brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave to me. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. You see, the first thing that Jesus prays for is he prays for himself. Jesus prays for himself. Now, this isn't the focus of today's message, but don't ever neglect, don't ever neglect you in your prayer life. Jesus knelt down and asked God to help him do the work of the Father. He says, glorify me that I may glorify you. God, I want to do this, but I'm going to need your help in making it happen. God, help me to be the one you created me to be so that you would be lifted up in my life. He prays for himself, but the focus is never on him. It's always on the glory of the Father. So before you start asking God to glorify yourself, which can be a very dangerous prayer to pray, Just know that it didn't lead to any riches for this man. It didn't lead to any kind of climbing of the corporate ladder or being the goat, the greatest of all time, according to the world's standard. We know otherwise, but it led him to the cross, praying for you to be led and to be honoring God in your life could lead you to some very difficult things. So unless you're willing to die for him, I'd be very careful on how you pray for yourself and what you are praying for, because if it leads to more glory for you, then it's not the right prayer. Secondly, let's continue on in his prayer. Verse nine and following, it says this, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours and all you have is mine and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are are one. Right there is our focus. That's our word for friends as we close out this series today. Community. Jesus prays for our unity. He prays for our community. He prays for our oneness, that we would be one as the Father and the Son are one. And then he goes on down in verse 13. He says, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. You see, Jesus prays before the cross. He prays for himself, but then he prays for his disciples. Jesus prays for his disciples. Those that are right there in front of him, following him. Those that are within earshot of his words and his prayers. The ones that have truly given up everything and sought after him. I mean, they literally laid down their nets and said, I don't know what this guy's doing, but his ways are better than mine. I'm going to go follow that guy. Now, just a couple of quick hitters that I found in my study for this week. Did you hear this? It says, I am praying for them. I'm not praying for this world. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for this world. How many times do we pray, God, would you please just fix this place around me? It's such a mess. Sin is everywhere. Hopelessness abounds. Woe is me that I have to live in such a sinful place around. God, would you provide, the, provide for this world so that they could see you more clearly? God, I pray for this world. And it sounds like such a great prayer, but it's not what Jesus prayed. He prays for his followers. He prays for them. Not because he doesn't see the world for the mess that it is, but he sees that the best way for the world to be impacted by his truth, his love, his forgiveness, is for his disciples to get off their tunics and actually do something about it, right? I mean, that's what he's praying for here before he goes to the cross, in the name of Jesus, for his glory and for his honor. Second little quick hitter. He prayed that they would have the full measure of his joy within them. If you're a disciple of King Jesus, we need to constantly be pursuing this joy in our lives, if you've been losing some of that joy, and let me just tell you, there's times when I really struggle with this. 
depending on the day, depending on what's going on, there's so many times that I lose that joy. And I'm guessing I'm not the only one in this place that has this happen. Circumstances come up, conversations are had, and it just sucks the life out of you. And it's so hard to get back to the joy that God has called us to. But when we do that, we must look at what Jesus has done for us and how he prayed for us. Because we are guilty as charged with joy going out of our lives, but when we are filled with the joy of the Spirit and we redirect our focus onto God that set before us wholeheartedly the joy that we can now have, no matter what, we can focus on that joy. We need to constantly be pursuing this in our lives. The third little quick hitter, he says this. He says, I'm not praying that you would take them out of the world. Okay, hold up. I'm not praying that you would take them out of the mess. Did you hear that? I'm not praying for all of us to be taken out of the messes that we are in. What he's saying is that I want our our warriors, our people that are following us, his disciples, he wants them in the battle. He wants them on the ground. He wants them in the trenches. He wants his warriors on the ground battling, being sanctified, which is an amazing word, but it's kind of a churchy word. It means that we are set apart for a purpose, what we were created to do. When we do that, we are sanctified in Jesus' name. Our very purpose was to be in the battle, giving God the glory for the victory all the way through the difficulties. So don't get me out of this place. Don't take me out of this mess. God, don't take me out of this world. Fix me while I'm in it so that I can help fix it. Did you hear that prayer in there? I mean, that's a big deal. So Jesus prays for himself. He prays for his disciples. And then the third thing Jesus prays for, we go down in verse 20 in our passage. It says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. There's our community word again. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me, and they loved them even as you have loved me. The third thing Jesus prays for is all who would believe. He prays for all who would believe. He prays for all of us, literally. And all of those in here who have not quite made a commitment to follow Jesus, you're still trying to uh, figure out this church thing. Anybody who's at home that you're not ready to go into the building yet and see all the crazy people, right? You're ready to just check it out online. Well, here's the deal. He is praying for you in this moment. He's praying for all of us who would believe and all of us who would come to believe. And what is he praying about for us? He prays that we would be one that we would be unified, that we would be in community together just as the Father and Jesus are one. And he says that beautiful word, complete unity. It's a finished product in the original language, a completed, a perfected unity under the grace of God that we would have a commonality in Jesus. It's a common unity. And so Jesus comes to the very last week of his life. This week that we celebrate heading towards the crucifixion on Friday and Resurrection Sunday, next Sunday, where we are going to celebrate our Easter together next weekend. And the main focus of his prayer before he goes to this death, burial, and resurrection is this. He prays for oneness. He prays for unity. He prays for a community together as he is with the Father. And so what does that mean? For us, What does that look like for us? He calls us to two things in the midst of his prayer. And we need to evaluate this ourselves constantly again and again because this is the area of our lives that will continuously be under attack by the evil one. And don't forget their context. He's ready to go to the cross. He knows that they're going to start questioning everything, that everybody around them is going to implode, and they're going to have to go into quiet places, into upper rooms, separated from everybody else. So when your life gets turned upside down, When everything that we have clung to for so long and relied on just gets stripped away from us and the direction that you thought you were supposed to go in, all of a sudden you get turned around and what do you do? And who do you rely on? It's what he prays for us here. First thing is community with God. He prays for community with God. Look in verse 21. It says, may they be in us. May they be in us. This is quite a unique invitation. He prays that we would be involved in the Trinity, in the triune God. This is the spirit would rest in us as a part of God. He is inviting us into a holy community. Ever wonder why we have this longing to belong in our lives? 
That no matter what phase of life we're in, what background we are, we long to belong. To have people that are in our corner that reflect who we are and who are accepting of us no matter what. That innate desire comes directly from the Garden of Eden and the creation of all things. When God looks down at us and he says, let us create man in our image. He creates us in the very image of God. We are a reflection of the creator God who in and of himself is a community, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. No wonder we move towards groups. No wonder we move towards communities and wanting to belong in this place because it's exactly who God created us to be. We're created to be like God. And that ultimate community can only be fulfilled within the presence of the Holy One. And he invites us into that holy communion with him through the sacrifice of the cross of Jesus, which we should be celebrating every day, but we celebrate it significantly this coming week. It was this way at the beginning, and when sin entered the, sin entered the world, It all fell apart and the entire rest of God's scriptures is his pursuit of us and our intimacy and community with him that could only be made possible through a once and for all offering of his son, Jesus. He gave up a part of himself so that we might be able to be made whole again in community. What an incredible invitation that we have. Let the spirit of the creator God dwell in you and you in him. Wow. Wow. So what do we regularly set aside time to do and energy? Is it to be in community with God? Do we sit in his presence? Do we sift through his word? Do we shift our attitudes? Do we sing to his glory? Do we share with him in prayer? These are all those spiritual disciplines that you hear again and again in church because we're trying to create these holy habits as we draw into community with God. Because at the end of the day, When what you have held so highly in this world is gone, if you have not found community with the holy God or don't know how to seek out that community with him, then you'll be left wandering around trying to look for answers in a place that just won't have them aside from him. And so may we commune with God. May we have community with God is Jesus' prayer for us. The second thing is this, is that we would have community with each other. That we would have community with each other both in verse 11 and in 22 of our passage to the disciples, he prays that we would all be one as he and the Father are one. How on earth do we do that? In a world that continues to push people and groups of people farther and farther apart from one another, the dividing lines are getting longer, aren't they? Divisions creep in when you're looking way too heavily at our differences and forgetting all about our commonalities that we have in Jesus, our commonalities within the church, within our relationship to God. The very fact that we are in these places coming together to worship is a unique community with one another. And for those that have committed their lives to Jesus, we stand in a community that knows no borders, no ethnicities, no socioeconomic delineations, no cultural biases, no worldly influences. Matt Chandler, a renowned preacher, said it this way. He says, we have more in common with an Iranian national who loves Jesus Christ than we do with an American who wants nothing to do with Jesus. That's a big statement, and that might offend some people, but the reality of it is it stands true on the grounds of Jesus' blood. When we submit ourselves to the lordship of Jesus, the differences that the world will throw at us cannot stand the test of community, but Jesus can. Relationship with him can stand all of those differences because we are solid on some things. Chandler goes on to say this. It made it very helpful for me this week. I hope it makes it helpful for you. He says, we have the same savior. We have the same story, sort of. We have the same assignment and we have one another. We have the same savior, we have the same story, we have the same assignment, and we have one another, all of which are based out of the words of God. The first thing, we have the same savior. We stand shoulder to shoulder with the son of the most high God who came leading and preaching and healing and submitting and dying and resurrecting. Remember, if we aren't preaching Jesus, then we're just talking and the world just doesn't need any more talking, okay? We have the same story, sort of. You see, all of our stories find power and strength in the redeeming blood of Jesus. It all rests on him. We get it quite backwards when our stories tend to focus more on who we are and what we've done instead of about who Jesus is. But God uses the uniqueness of all of us to bring us to the understanding in completely different ways sometimes. So while our roadmaps might have taken us on completely different routes, those that are in Christ have ended up in the same saving grace place of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, we have this same assignment. 
We have the same assignment. Look at the reasoning for us to be together. Look at the reason for the oneness, the community that he prays about for us. See, it says that we are being sent in verse 18. It says, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And then again in 21, may they also be in us, here's the reason, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Our jobs, our purpose, while we wait for the Holy One to return, is incredibly clear in Scripture. We are given the ministry of reconciliation is what Paul calls it, to draw other communities outside of this one into relationship with God. And Jesus charges us to go at the end of the gospel of Matthew. He says, go, he says, go, he says, go into all nations, all nations, whether that's the nation that moved in down the block uh, just a couple weeks ago, or whether that's the nation that lives down the block that you've been there, they've been there forever and you've never had a conversation. Maybe that's the nation that is completely around the globe and is having trouble even getting their language translated into scripture so they can hear the very words of God. He says to go and make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. And then he says this statement, as we have this assignment, he says, and I will be with you to the very end of the age. How is that? How is it that he is with us? Well, because you've already been in community with him. Before you go, as you're going, when you get there, when you come home, you're already in community with him. You see, we have the same assignment that God has given all of us who believe. And then finally, we have one another. We have the same savior, we have the same story, we have the same assignment, and we have one another. There are 94 one another's in the New Testament. Paul has the majority of these uses when he's writing letters to different churches and communities of churches and individuals who are leading those different communities. And then guys like Peter and James and John, and then where it all originated from was this guy named Jesus who we've talked about, all have this emphasis on us being together. A third of those passages talk about the unity of one another. Another third of them talk about loving one another. And while even more speak of humility towards one another, bearing one another's burdens, praying for one another, you see, you are not meant, you are not meant to live this life alone. And when the evil one is at his best, he separates and isolates and manipulates us into states of aloneness instead of oneness, states of solitude instead of solidarity, states of seclusion instead of inclusion, and states of embarrassment instead of being embraced by the arms of those that love you no matter what because they know that you love them no matter what under the grace of Jesus Christ. God, in all of his wisdom, placed you in this place at this time with these people, your one another's, so that your community could fully be the revelation of God to those around you. You see, Jesus prays for us to have community with each other, and he prays for us to have community with God. And when we take those things for granted, which so often that we do, we assume that they are there and we don't put in the time for them, we don't put in the effort, and we don't fulfill the very desires of our Savior's prayer in the moment when he's saying that we're going to need it the most because he's going to the cross for us to do the saving. He says we miss God's very hope for all of us in this world. Now hear this as we close out. The community out there desperately needs the community in here to be, the, to be in community with God the Father. The community out there desperately needs the community in here to be in community with the Father. And why is that? So more and 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 more communities would come to know the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ who has called us into community now and every day leading up to the cross and every day moving forward. That's what God has called us to. That's why he gives us these words that we can use them to glorify him together as one. If you would, please stand with me as we close out in prayer. Father God, we stand in your midst, God, in your spirit, and it is in this place, and we feel it today. And God, I just pray that this community would be honoring to you, that you would glorify us for the sole purpose of glorifying you, that you would lead us to your cross each and every day, and we would recognize the sacrifice that comes from your son, Jesus. 
But God, we sit on the other side of the resurrection, and so now we rest in your words to say we need to be one. We need to be a community together that is reaching out with your grace and your mercy. And so God, give us the courage and the boldness to do just that. God, we thank you for your son, and we thank you for his words that he gives to us. God, we love you and praise you. It's in your son's beautiful name we pray. Amen.